Good evening. I'm Amy Lizer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Monroe County Historical Association, and I'd like to welcome you to our third Thursday lecture series. I'm so very happy to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Bill Leonard. Bill Leonard's family, along with the Coolbaugh Township Historical Association, have held the annual Toby Hanna Mill Pond No. 1 Ice Harvest since 1994. His father, grandfather, and great-grandfather all worked in the ice industry. As a local history buff, Bill explores the forests of the former Toby Hanna Military Reservation, now State Game Lands 127, for remnants of the ice industry, the logging error, and past military activity. Bill serves as a board member of both the Monroe County Historical Association and the Coolbaugh Township Historical Association. A graduate of Penn State, Bill holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering. He served as the facilities engineer at Toby Hanna Army Depot and retired from the National Park Service in April of 2016 as the deputy superintendent of the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. He lives in Toby Hanna with his wife, Diane, and his dog, Max. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to welcome Bill who will give us his, pres his presentation, Ice Harvesting in Monroe County. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bill. Okay, thank you, Amy. It's all yours, take it away. All right, <laughs> we'll get underway here. Uh, I became interested in ice harvesting uh, because of my dad. Uh, he had been collecting tools for many years, both he and uh, Dr. Kitchen had actually, Dr. James Kitchen, who was a local historian, did a lot of uh, programs around the area, Tobiana State Park, and I tag along once in a while. Uh, and uh, as Amy said, my dad, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather were all ice harvesters. And uh, for the last 29 years, uh, we, along with the Kuba Township Historical Association, have been cutting ice. So uh, I'm a fourth-generation ice harvester. This is uh, more or less what I'm going to talk about. Uh, why the heck harvest ice when you can just go to a refrigerator and push a button? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about small farm operations and the commercial ice industry. Uh, I'll talk about the process. I've got some pictures of the past ice houses in Monroe County. And I'll talk about our modern day ice harvest we've been doing. And then I've got some information on tools and then uh, some miscellaneous stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. So the ice box uh, came around uh, about 1840. Uh, and that ice box was kept cold with a block of ice that was cut from local lakes or ponds or rivers, uh, delivered to the household, individual household by the ice man. They were usually a wooden cabinet uh, lined with zinc, insulated with sawdust or cork or straw. And it was a pan at the bottom of the, of the ice box, and that had to be emptied daily because of the, the ice drip. And the ice would usually last about a day or two, depending upon how often it was opened or or the outside temperature. Uh, small farm operations, uh, they were the first ice harvesters in America. Uh, a bunch of farmers got together to cut ice off of a local pond. Uh, they used wood saws at the time or axes, uh, constructed a mall, small ice house to keep the, uh, the ice in. And here's an example of Quiet Valley Living Historical Farm uh, this past winter. Uh, in, in Snydersville. Uh, similar to the farms of old, folks got together and cut some ice, loaded on to a sleigh or a wagon. Uh, the ice we cut here about 14 inches square and then uh, last year it was about 10 inches thick. And off to the ice house. The ice house at Quiet Valley is, is about, uh, about a half mile from the pond. And this is the ice house, it's a small ice house. It's gonna hold about 10 tons. Uh, and we stack the ice about 10 inches from the wall. And then uh, there's sawdust on this, on this side here. And we put sawdust around the outside of that and, and pack it in good and fill it right up to the top and seal up the door. And that ice will keep till the, uh, the harvest festival which is held each year in October. Some uh, local resorts, uh, farms had uh, ice houses. Here's a couple of farm ice houses. Uh, well-to-do homes had, 
had ice houses. Uh, George Washington had one in uh, Mount Vernon. Uh, Well-built ones like these stone structures uh, still survived. Uh, wooden ones pretty much wasted away. Some of these are repurposed as sheds, but you'll still, still see them sticking in the back of some, some large farms or some resorts. Uh, Pocono Manor Ice Harvest in 1919. This is a YouTube video. You can go online and look at that. Uh, Lake Lenape had a ice, uh, they harvested ice off Lake Lenape for the Kittatinny Hotel in Delaware Water Gap. And they harvested ice off of Deer Lake for the Buck Hill Inn in Barrett Township. A little bit of a timeline here on the, on the commercial ice industry. A uh, gentleman, 20 year old gentleman by the name of Frederick Tudor from Boston, Massachusetts, he loaded ice on a ship and sailed to Martinique in 19, 1806. He was known as the Ice King, pretty much uh, the first uh, commercial ice operation. Uh, Nathaniel Wife, Wife invented the ice plow, uh, the horse drawn ice cutter. And that's a picture of it on the right hand side. I'll talk a little bit about more in a future slide here. Uh, I mentioned the ice box was invented in 1840. And along came uh, the power I saw in 1910. Uh, that could cut as fast as five horse drawn plows. And the heyday of the ice harvesting was uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, the refrigerator, first early modern refrigerator came about around 1911, the General Electric Mechanical Ice Box, it was called. It was noisy and it used sulfur dioxide. Uh, but then around 1930, uh, refrigerators became more common. Uh, uh, more affordable. Well, that was pretty much the beginning of the end for the, for the ice industry, but there was still, uh, still pockets of the ice industry still happening into the early 50s and they were used for uh, cooling box cars. And I'll have more information on that shortly. <coughs> the process uh, on the left hand side there is called the Boston scraper, uh, pulled by horses to keep the snow off the ice. Later, they used tractors like on the right hand side, that's from Warnertown Ice Harvest. But uh, this, it was important to keep the snow off the ice to ensure good quality ice. Uh, it was amazing how, how much a little bit of snow on the ice will retard the freezing. Uh, we've learned over the last 29 years by trial and error. Uh, but on a good cold night, when it gets down around zero degrees in Toby Hanna, it'll grow an inch a night. A little bit of snow on top of there, and that, that doesn't freeze as much. Alternative to scraping the, the snow off the ice before they could put a team of horses or a tractor on there, they call sinking the field. Guys would go out with bars and they poke holes in that thin ice, maybe, well, maybe two inches or three inches thick, not enough to hold a horse. They'd poke holes in the ice and the water would flood up on top and freeze that snow and it would help the ice grow. <clears throat> the ideal thickness back in the day was 12 to 14 inches. Uh, the cakes they cut uh, were 22 inches by 30, 32 inches. So each cake would weigh about 300 pounds. Uh, I've got newspaper articles that said in 1944, they started cutting ice on December 22nd. Uh, that's a kind of a rarity. We're, we're lucky if we have enough ice in late December, early January, uh, but ideally 12 inches thick. Uh, they'd usually cut uh, two harvests off a year. They'd cut ice off of the whole lake and then come back again after it froze again up to 12 inches and cut again, and sometimes three harvests. On the right-hand side, you see an auger and a measuring tool. We use that to measure how thick the ice is, and there's an excerpt from Doc Kitchen's movie where they actually measure in the thickness of the ice. I talked about when they sink the field, you get this uh, frozen snow on top. Well, that was not good quality ice. It was porous and it wouldn't, wouldn't keep things as cold. So they used to uh, scrape the, the snow off, the snow ice off the top. Uh, 
This gadget was also called the cultivator. Uh, on the left-hand side is uh, one of our early harvests where we had a horse out on the ice and pulling a cultivator around to, to scrape that, that snow off the top. And on the right-hand side is the picture from uh, 1893 in Goosborough where they were, might've been the same cultivator. The alternative was to uh, remove the snow ice on the, on the conveyor, and you haven't seen a conveyor yet, but I'll show you some pictures in, in a second here. But it would scrape the, uh, the snow ice off the top of the, the cake as it passed up the conveyor. Uh, and then actually the picture on the right is from Dr. James Kitchen movie, but it's a little hard to see. It's, when it's a moving picture, you can see it a lot better. <clears throat> In order to start, before you cut the ice, you have to lay out the field. Uh, the field crew would uh, take, use some strings and put a straight line across there. And then they pull, the, pull this gadget called a, a plow. Uh, or a, a horse here. And that, that plow, I've got some pictures of it. I'll show you in a second here. The, uh, the standard size cake, like I said, was uh, 22 by 32. On the right hand side, we cut 22 by 22. They're a little more manageable. We have a smaller ice house. Here's the plow, uh, horse drawn. The sharp edges here on the, on the bottom of this plow here. And this is a guide that goes in the groove, the previous groove. And after you, a good sharp plow pulled by a horse will cut uh, about a two inch deep groove in the ice. You go back and forth in that same groove about two thirds of the way to the ice. <laughs> Turn 90 degrees and do the same thing. The other, they have a different guide. They used to do the 33 inch guide. This one's a 22 inch. You keep cutting back and forth until the ice is cut about two thirds of the way. As I mentioned earlier, one ice plow could cut as fast as 50 men with hand, hand saws. <laughs> Then the gasoline powered ice saw, patented in 1910, kind of a crude looking object there on the left. But on the right is a uh, 1918 Gifford Wood power saw. And one of those Gifford Wood power saws could cut as fast as five horse drawn plows. So one of those equals 250 men. Greatly improved the uh, operations in the ice field. Sold for $1,700 in 1919. As I mentioned, they, they cut two thirds of the way through with the, the plow or even the, the power saw. They wouldn't cut all the way through. Uh, but now you got open grooves there. And if the water would run back those grooves, uh, it would freeze up those that work they already did. So they had a, they called caulking the saw cut. So it was a special bar, had a blunt end on it, and they'd put wood chips and, and uh, snow in that groove and tamp it so that the water doesn't run back and freeze that, uh, that groove shut. And then they'd use these uh, power saws, uh, jig saw they called them, or they called them also a grasshopper. What it is is a, uh, it's actually a log saw mounted on a, a frame. And the reason they call it a grasshopper is because sometimes that thing would jump up on top of the ice and it would jump around like a grasshopper. They cut off large sections, uh, about uh, 15 feet by 30 feet. And there's another, there they go. You, you can see where they cut off a large section here. Uh, and they're called floats or flows. And then they move that over to, through the channels over toward the, uh, the ice house. Uh, these particular pictures are from Gooseboro. And then at the water box, the water box is at the base of the conveyor. They split those individual in the individual cakes. Again, they were cut about two thirds of the way through, but with the special bars here, one slice with the bar would, would break that break that apart, and then they move those individual cakes onto the conveyor. On the right hand side, this is ice harvesting harvesting natural ice at the now present Toby Hannon State Park. And then they're fed into a steam driven conveyor. You see the ice cakes on the left hand side going up. There's another view of it coming up from the lake into the ice house. Earlier operations, they used horses, but uh, 
they mechanized and went to steam driven conveyors. And those conveyors would run back along the ice house. And then uh, these ice houses had individual rooms. And uh, somebody would sit there at the edge of the uh, conveyor and pull those cakes into the house. They'd go down a ramp and uh, they call the switcher at the bottom of the ramp to direct those cakes into the, into the ice house. On the right there is a chunk boy. He sat along the edge of the conveyor. And if there was any of the cakes that were broken or uh, weren't, uh, weren't quite rectangular, the right shape, he'd pull that cake off and waste it. And that was my dad's job. He, when he was a boy, he, uh, he worked as a chunk boy along the, along the conveyor there. This is a overview of the uh, mill pond number one ice house. Give you a little perspective here. Okay, most of this is open water here. <clears throat> so they're bringing the, the floats in here and uh, they bring them in. This is the end of the conveyor. They bring them in the water box. They'll split the individual cakes on there. And then going up the, uh, the incline here, you see those cakes of ice. And this starts off lower. And then as the ice house gets filled, they, they keep raising that up. They also call this a galley. And this, as you can see, uh, it's almost full. It's, almost to the top of the, the ice house there. So they're just about done harvesting for the winter in this ice house. The ice house uh, walls were insulated with sawdust, uh, about 12 inch thick walls. And they'd put sawdust in between. And then on top of the ice, they'd put uh, salt hay on top of the ice and that would keep, uh, keep all summer long. I also saw references to, they put heavy paper on before they put the the straw on that would keep it uh, so the straw wouldn't get the ice all all dirty. Sometimes it was loaded directly into boxcars. Uh, on the left hand side picture here, you can see the boxcar station right alongside, and they can pull those cakes and load them right into the boxcar, ship them immediately to the uh, immediately to the cities uh, while they're harvesting. On the right hand side, there is a Typical ice box car. All summer long, then they, they had a summer crew on, usually about 15 to 20 workers who would uh, load the box cars. They'd move the ice from the uh, ice house, load them in the box cars. Each railroad box car would hold about 20 tons of ice. Uh, and they had a lot, a lot of melting loss. Uh, about 25% before reaching uh, New York and Philadelphia, all that shrinkage. The uh, refrigerated cars for shipping perishable foods, that was the last great demand for ice in the area. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see where the loading ice into the ends of these box cars. In the lower right here, you see there's ice tank. They put the ice in there and then there's hanging beef or fruit or whatever perishables for, uh, for shipment to keep, keep it cold. Steamtown National Historic Site in uh, Scranton has the uh, DL and W railroad records for icing boxcars from the uh, early 1900s. And it tells how much ice they put in each car. And I think I have a slide that shows that. Then it was shipped by railroad, uh, primary New York City, Hoboken, the DL and W railroad. In uh, 1899, the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad charged 65 cents a ton for delivery of ice to New York City. Then when we got to the destination, uh, they cut those into smaller cakes and put them on a wagon and deliver them to the ice, to, to the uh, individual merchants. The upper right is a card. Uh, the homeowner would hang that in the window, whether they wanted 25, 50, or 75, or 100 pounds of ice, and the ice man would deliver and put that in right in the ice box. And you can see in a couple of days when that melts. The lower right hand side here, uh, that was an ice wagon that somebody brought to one of our harvests about uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Back to Mill Pond number one ice house. Uh, 
Many lakes in the Poconos were dammed originally for the logging industry, as was Mill Pond number one. And then when the area was all timbered off in the late 1800s, uh, the uh, ice industry took over. The, uh, this particular one was owned by the Obihan and Lehigh Lumber Company, and they leased it to the Pocono Mountain Ice Company. They built a small ice house here in 1896. Uh, that burnt down. They built a larger one in uh, 1907, which is a picture here. This ice house was 500 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 50 feet high. It was a massive structure. It holds 60,000 tons of ice. And this particular one, uh, it was in operation until it burned down in 1938. In our ice house where we do uh, modern day ice harvest sits in the same location where this ice house was located. Another picture of number one ice plant uh, in the background there is the horse barn. In the foreground here is a uh, ice plow and you see a sharpener there, that guy, they had uh, somebody on time, on staff all the time, one of the workers, uh, his job was to sharpen tools, a lot of tools. They had a blacksmith on, on, on standby also and a carpenter. More views of Toby Hannon Ice House number one. Uh, you see these piles of waste ice here that the, the, the uh, chunk boy pulled off. They were broken cakes. Uh, local folks used to go out there and uh, in the early summer and they'd get free ice. Those, those piles would still be there and it was free for the taking. It's a picture of the ice house in the summertime, massive structure. Again, that's ice house number one. And another one, uh, this particular ice house at, at Mill Pond number one had uh, also had a car conveyor where they'd load, load directly in the car as a different uh, spur went down to the lake. This is the power plant here and the ice, the rest of the ice house went down to the right. This is the number three plant at to present Toby Hannah State Park. There were two ice houses at that lake, number two and number three. And you, you can see the engine room here. This one had actually three conveyors. You can see the three, three engine rooms there. And that's the same, uh, same plant in the summertime. A uh, small portion of this foundation still remains. Pocono Lake Ice, Ice Company. I'm sorry, Pocono Lake. Uh, this is, had six rooms. Uh, again, sawdust insulation and sawdust, of course, was readily available. The, the, the uh, logging operation was winding down, so there was a lot of sawdust around, so they used that for the uh, insulation. Uh, Dr. James Kitchen had told the story one year when they had a mild winter in 1932 and 33, the Pocono Lake Ice House, the largest in the area, the ice harvesters worked 11 days, day and night during early March during a cold spell to get ice in the ice house. So they had some warm winters back then too, but they had to make ice while the ice was there. <clears throat> Another ice house in, uh, in Kuba Township, Lynchwood Lake, former Camp Tekawitha. The Pocono area ice companies were harvesting ice for about six cents a ton. Uh, the field workers were paid 30 cents an hour and the uh, ice house workers were paid 35 cents an hour for those 35, for those 300 pound uh, chunks of ice were moving around. Here's Gooseboro, uh, a portion of Gooseboro State Park is in Kuba Township, which is in Monroe County. So we're still in Monroe County here. Actually, there were uh, several lakes in Gooseboro where they harvested ice. Uh, this is the Toby present to Gooseboro State Park. And on the left there, in the lower left, that's the icing records from the uh, from Steamtown National Historic Site. On February 11th, 1914, they iced five boxcars Hauling, hauling meat to Hoboken. They put in 600 pounds of ice and six, 60 pounds of salt. The air temperature was six degrees above zero. Got some more ice house pictures here. Uh, these are all from uh, compliments of, of uh, Mr. Kim Williams. Uh, Kim had done a lot of research on ice. And he's got a presentation too that talks about ice and railroads. Uh, but I've stolen some of his pictures and put them in here just to give you a feel for the the ice houses around the area, Lake Naomi and Pocono Pines, uh, Pocono Summit, uh, 
according to Kim's count, there were 19 lakes in Monroe County that had uh, large ice houses serviced by the, uh, the DL and W and the Wilkes Barre and Eastern Railroad. A few more of Kim's pictures. Uh, Sailor's Lake uh, was originally known as Lake Papanomi. Large structures. Trout Lake, uh, and actually the uh, parts of the foundation are still evident there at the Trout Lake Resort. That's near readers. And a few more. Arlington Lake was a small, small operation. I don't believe there was a railroad connection to that. Mountain Springs and readers. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the Watertown ice industry because uh, I've got quite a bit of information on that. Uh, this is a map, 1918 Toby Hanna Military Reservation map, and it actually shows the railroad spur coming in from the main, you can't see the main line, but we're closer to Toby Hanna. Watertown is about halfway between Toby Hanna and Pocono Pines on Route 423, and it actually shows the ice house on this 1918 map and the railroad spurs going around both sides of the ice house. And this is a, a 1939 photograph, aerial photograph of uh, Warnertown, uh, Tobihanna Creek. This is Route 423 coming from Tobihanna to Pocono Pines. Uh, here's the railroad spur, and actually there's a, a box cars on the railroad spur. They had a scale there, an ice house. And there's the water box where the, where the ice came into the the ice house, boathouse, that was just for recreation. Root cellar was still there. Uh, boarding house is gone. No remnants of that. But there's a horse barn. The remnants of the horse barn are still there. The foundation is still there. The pictures from uh, the Watertown operation. They started in uh, 1902 and they ended the operation there in 1952. Lower right is the water box there. And this is what it looks like today. Uh, it's now off part, of, this is part of state game land number 127 in Kuba Township. And you can still see parts of the foundation. And this is uh, where the conveyor ran up the middle of the, the ice house on both sides is the conveyor from the lake and the water box came up through there. And these walls are about four feet high. And these are 120 years old, and those are holding up in really good shape. On the left is the remains of where the water box water is, what it looks like today, and that's the operation on the, on the right-hand side there. They had a truck scale. Uh, they would ship ice from uh, this ice plant to uh, the bar rooms in Scranton. A gentleman by the name of John Vosilishin delivered the ice. Uh, during the war, his sister Eva delivered the ice to Scranton. On the upper right is an old picture from uh, Watertown clearing snow off the ice. And in the lower left, a uh, local guy uh, purchased this tractor when the ice house went out of business for $20 in the 1950s. Excuse me. A gentleman by name is Steve Boswish and just donated that to the Kuba Township Historical Association. So we put it there by the ice house. And a lot of words and stuff on this, but uh, these ice houses had uh, tough operations. Uh, this one was built in 1902 and it blew down that same year. They reconstructed it, burnt down in 1917 and rebuilt it. The dam washed out in 1940, the roof blew off in 1942. So uh, it was quite a bit of work to keep these things uh, in operation. And the last harvest was 1951-52. Again, thanks to uh, Mr. Kim Williams for researching all these magazine newspaper articles here. <clears throat> Needed a lot of workers to uh, keep these operations going. And Watertown boarding house on the left-hand side, that's a picture from 1954. After the operation stopped, the house still stood there. Uh, local lady actually lived there when she was when she was a child. Over in Brady's Lake, over uh, off of Route Nine Forty, there, uh, Brady brothers ran the operation there, and Edward Brady uh, kept the ice harvesters over one year, nineteen fourteen or nineteen fifteen, 
and they built a nice house, I mean a castle, uh, to serve as a boarding house, but he built a memory as a, from a castle he knew in the county of Donegal in Ireland. And this castle was 75 feet long and 35 feet wide. And the Brady family used it the rest of the year as like a summer home. Uh, the heyday of the ice harvesting, uh, reported in the early 1900s, the ice harvesting was the largest industry in Monroe County. Uh, each, house, each ice house operation uh, employed up to 100 workers during the height of the season. Uh, and it was a shortage of labor. Uh, I mentioned earlier that only $2 or $2.50 a day. Uh, they had shipped in workers from outside. And actually, during World War II, they had used German prisoners of war from, uh, that were boarded at Toby Hanna Military Reservation. They uh, helped out harvesting ice. The first annual meeting of the Eastern Ice Association, November 7th and 8th, 1907 in Philadelphia. They had 130 attendees. And uh, this came from the Cold Storage and Ice Trade Journal, which is a, uh, have all kinds of articles about ingenuity and what works good here and what works good there. And uh, a lot of what doesn't work, a lot of good information in, those, uh, in that journal. And they actually had a convention here in Strasbourg in the Indian Queen Hotel, December 16th and 17th, 1909. They had 65 people attending. The company motto was, a block of ice never gets out of order. It was a big industry for about 30 years. <laughs> but then along came that darn electric refrigerator. Uh, Newspaper article here. I've got a couple excerpts here. I'll read. I'll read a couple parts here. Albert Sassenbeck, he's from over, over in Pocono Lake, superintendent of operations, can recall with misty eyes the days when ice and lumber were indeed king of the Poconos. Those of us who lived in the days of ice were proud to own an ice box from which a few chips could be obtained on a warm summer night to cool a glass of homemade root beer, or regret to see the passing of commodity as a link to the chain of life of other days. And then uh, the modern child will probably not recognize a pair of ice tongs any more than that he will a horse's curry tone comb. So it was uh, pretty much the beginning of the end there. And then uh, this 1951, uh, the natural ice, the, Business is dead for all practical purposes, as bound to the refrigeration age. The deep freeze cabinets offer too much competition. Another problem I mentioned fires at Watertown. Uh, these ice houses uh, were very high structures, 50 feet high. Again, it was all timbered off. So they were sticking right up there and uh, pretty much attracted the lightning. So uh, there was about a uh, fire at the number three ice plant, which is at the uh, Tobiana State Park. And that was located right where the uh, the boat launch parking area is. Nice flat spot there. That's where the ice house was located. Uh, about the ice house, last one of the last regional ice houses burns uh, September 1963. Uh, over in Gooseboro there, and the foundations for uh, some of the ice houses, at least three of the ice houses there, are still evident. And then what happened when these fires burnt, uh, there was still blocks of ice piled up there. Uh, another cause of fire was sparks from steam locomotives. On the lower left there is actually uh, one of the Mill Pond number one ice house fires. And I'll talk about our modern day ice harvest operation. Uh, since the Kuba Township Bicentennial in 1994, uh, my dad had been collecting ice tools for many years and decided to reenact an ice harvest. Uh, we built the ice house. That ice house will hold 50 tons of ice. Um, my dad doesn't 
died, died suddenly of a heart attack in October 1993. So uh, my brother and sister and I and uncles and aunts and relatives and friends and neighbors uh, completed the ramp. And we've had our first ice harvest in February of 1994 with the Kuba Township Bicentennial. The ice was 24 inches thick that day. It's quite an operation. Uh, We've done it every year since. Uh, some years we only had five inches of ice, but we cut a couple of cakes and put them in the ice house. Uh, Kuba Township Historical Association, co sponsor of the event, uh, helps with expenses. And we're going to have our 30th annual ice harvest uh, January, last Saturday in January, uh, next, next, next January. The early ice harvest, we used the plows. Here we can pull them with, with people, but we also use tractors to pull the plows. Took us two days to fill the ice house. But then we mechanized. My dad had acquired this uh, old ice saw, and uh, my uncle Nelson Sachs and Harry Smith, uh, local jack of all trades, got this thing going. Uh, and we've used this every year since 2002. It's a uh, four cylinder boot engine with a crank start. And uh, one year it was 18 degrees below zero. It took a lot of cranks to get that thing going. Again, we do like they did years ago, cut two thirds of the way through, then split it off, or else hand saws. This guy is set to cut it at 22 inches. This is this past January. Uh, it was six degrees and 20 mile an hour wind. Uh, we had 16 inches of ice, and we were a little concerned that nobody would come, but we had over 200 people come out. You can see some of the tools there we've got piled up. And then everybody's invited to grab a handsaw and, and saw off a piece of ice. And then the kids like to move the ice cakes along the channel, to the base of the uh, our water box. We attach a hook to the uh, to the ice cakes. And we use the horses to pull them up the incline. Is uh, we had uh, let's see there. Fjords and, and the Persian from uh, Black Horse Farm. Dave Swingle brings his horses over. And then, then the ice house. Uh, we'll put 54 cakes per layer. And we've got a full house, uh, 50 tons. Uh, when we first harvested ice in 1994, we never anticipated that we'd be doing this for an annual event for nearly 30 years. One year, Steamtown National Historic Flight brought a train load of folks down from Scranton. They disconnected the uh, locomotive and drove by the lake and blew the whistle. That was something. The uh, Kuma Township Historical Association opens up the Wills Mansion, serves hot chocolate. We've got videos and pictures about ice harvest in there. Local VFW Post 509 serves breakfast and lunch. Everybody has a good time. We've got a core group of about eh, about 30 people who come year after year, many of whom uh, had fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers that worked in the ice industry. I'm going to tell them the last Saturday of January, weather permitting. For the 25th anniversary, we, the Kuba Township Historical Association had uh, coins made. And then uh, 2003, that was our 10th harvest, we had uh, wooden nickels. A lot of people ask what you do with ice. My answer, my quick answer is uh, to keep things cold. <laughs> Here's my sister's quote here. We strengthen family ties and lifelong friendships. We make new friends every year. We show kids how life was in the old days. We see the delight in their eyes. And we give old timers a chance to share memories. That's a natural organic ice there. Uh, temperature range over the years, 18 below zero one year. 57 degrees one year. Uh, anybody who helps out can use the ice for picnics or whatever, uh, fishing trips. We've taken it to Penn State and tailgate parties. Uh, and actually last Saturday, the Appenzell Church came and took uh, 10 cakes of ice for their annual picnic. We've got a little bit left in there. Uh, Steamtown National Historic Site uh, was accessing this boxcar and thanks to the, uh, the Keating and Sorachi families, uh, made arrangements to get this boxcar moved to uh, near the ice house. 
what it looked like in the lower right hand side. And uh, again, my uncle Nelson Sachs and Harry Smith and several others uh, fixed it up, painted it to replicate an ice car, and we use it to store tools. One of the tools my dad had collected over the years. And uh, a, a curious thing. Uh, after ice harvest, we go in there and put the tools away, and there's more tools in there than we started with. People bring stuff that uh, had been used in the ice industry and just drop it off and donate it to us. Some of the uh, ice bars, different functions. Uh, this one on the right here uh, looks like a bent bar. Uh, that's a special bar for, uh, for the summer crew. They'd use that to pop the cakes of ice apart from one another. A little leverage there. The center thing there is a caulking bar, scale for weighting the ice and the pike pole or ice hook on the right hand side. Get a hand saw, measuring iron, sieve shovel to get the, uh, the slush out of the out of the water box and then the uh, ice creeper. Talked about the ice plow, hold by a horse. We've got uh, about four or five of those. Again, one one horse drawn ice plow could cut as fast as 50 men with hand saws. More tools, ice axes, special shoes for the horses with cocks on them so they wouldn't slip. Went to the bars. The uh, Antique Ice Tool Museum in Westchester, Pennsylvania. We took a trip down there a couple of years ago. It's uh, in an old barn, largest private collection of ice tools in the United States. It's owned by the, the Stack family. They've come to our harvest a couple of times. We went down and they treated us real well down there and they gave us lunch, but a uh, bunch of ice hooks and, and, and uh, saw plows and, and uh, everything. Bunch of ice boxes. And one other question people asked how much ice cost. Oh, it varied. <laughs> uh, the Utica Ice Company, 1901, uh, it was 25, it was 50 cents per 100 pounds. 25 pounds four times a week was 50 cents. Uh, the Ice Trade Journal said, uh, 100 pounds went up to 60 cents in 1913. And lower right there was Strasbourg in the 1930s. It was 35 cents for 100 pounds. Went buried. And I guess uh, ice harvesting went back before Christ. Uh, you know, Northwest Persia, 1700 BC, and in China, 7th century BC. All the ice workers had badges to keep track of. Keep track of the men. Men all had numbers. The horses had names. Two trinkets from the ice companies, Pokemon Mountain Ice Company, a letter opener, pocket knife. And uh, they had the, the uh, National Ice Association of America uh, made sure that the uh, ice was, was pure. Uh, in some of the metropolitan areas, they had a problem with pollution, but the Poconos became known as a uh, a good source of uh, good ice, clear ice, clean ice. The beer, uh, brochure put out by the Department of Agriculture in 1920 tells you how to how to cut ice. Interesting fact there: that under normal, under ordinary circumstances, from about one half to one ton of ice per cow is needed annually for cooling cream, and from one and a half to two tons for cooling milk on a dairy farm. And catalogs selling ice, ice tools here. This uh, ice saw sold for five dollars to five fifty each. The uh, this is a gift. This is a wood company. They later joined with the Gifford brothers and formed the Gifford Wood Ice Company. And this is pretty much a bible for the ice harvest in eighteen ninety nine. Told all kinds of legal matters and cutting and storing ice and recipes and all kinds of things. Uh, some little lingo, <laughs> and, and we've, we've seen this in print and we actually lived it for the last 30 years, dead ice, when a cake of ice stops on the flat section of the conveyor or even on the, on the ice, it freezes, called dead ice. If you keep it moving, it's a lot better. 
scratchers, they put nails in the ramps that go down to the ice house to slow down the ice so it doesn't go too fast. I talked about the floats where they uh, cut off the large section. Gallery was a, where the conveyor went along the ice house. The switcher was a guy at the bottom of that ramp coming in the ice house that had to direct those 300 pound cakes to the right spot. Uh, and then the stacker would, would put them in the right place, tamping the ice with the, with the uh, certain bar. Night gang, they had to keep that uh, they had to keep that channel open all night long, so they'd uh, had a guy stand on. They'd keep they pull a float back and forth through that channel to keep it from freezing over. Because on a good night, excuse me, at least it'd get at least an inch of ice. Sap ice was that uh, frosted ice where frozen snow shrinks when the ice melts in the, in the shipment. Artificial ice is from the from their modern refrigerators. Uh, friction. The, a lot of the folks called the conveyor the friction because it was driven by friction and if it hit something, it, was, it would slip. So they had to be, the friction had to be adjusted just right. And the shine boy, uh, horses, uh, when they gotta go, they go. Uh, and then horse poop on the ice is not a good thing. So uh, the, uh, they had a guy, a little boy with a sled and he'd go out there with a shovel and uh, scrape up that ice as fast as possible, but there'd be a shiny spot in the ice for that. Uh, where that horse poop was, and so they call him a shine boy. Uh, some of the sources of information, both Kubot Township and Monroe County Historical Association got a lot of information. Several books there, and different folks. Uh, the one, folks on the left have passed away. My dad, Dr. James Kitchen, Roy Franks, Dan Kramer, my uncle. And then other folks here on the right-hand side, Mr. Kim Williams and, and some others have given me information for, for this stuff. Uh, presentation here. This is from the first issue of the Ice Trade Journal. Uh, what is particularly gratifying about the entire business is that it is more than any other the exclusive result of labor. There are no raw material to furnish to the dealer. There are no seeds to be sown upon the ice field. The beneficent creator in a night makes captive with frosty chains the running river and its congealed treasures need but the labor of man to make them minister to his wants and profits. As it surfaces the stream, it possesses no commercial value, but by the force of labor, it is lifted into one of the most valuable assets of industry. Something is produced from nothing and a product added to the nation's wealth. And that's from volume one, number one of the Ice Trade Journal from 1877. Not much left anymore. Uh, when we first started our, our modern day ice harvest uh, 30 years ago, there used to be folks come around and say, oh yeah, I got ice. And we talked to them for a little bit, you know, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll take it together and talk about it again. Well, not too many of those guys left anymore. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I know about ice harvesting. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Well, I'd say you know a lot about ice harvesting, Bill. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. That was really great. Oh. As you know, my uh, my family and I attended this year's ice harvest, come up to visit you. And on that cold day, <laughs> it was pretty darn cold, that's for sure. But what an amazing experience it was. Not only just for me, but for my kids as well. We loved it. And I learned so much. And you know, reading about in a book and seeing pictures, but to get up there and really do it and saw at that ice and it's it's a tough job. I was done after only a couple hours. I, I had had enough. So uh, I certainly encourage anybody that lives in the area to, to go and experience it really it really is living history. We do have some questions for you. All right. First one. So how did they keep the first line straight when they were cutting the ice? They strung a string across the field, uh, and then uh, and that's what we do today with the plow. Uh, and then you got to guide that plow. Actually, they had a hand plow, which we don't have, but we used a regular horse-drawn plow. We just push it by hand and just keep it parallel to that string and draw a straight line. And then uh, we use a mechanism for a three, four, five triangle to make a 90 degrees. 
and we lay another line out that way. Once you get two lines, straight lines, and then the guide from the saw or the plow goes in that pre previous groove. You make one groove, and then it keeps it keeps cutting every twenty two inches or thirty three inches. Wow. Um, have you ever thought about writing a book about the ice industry? <laughs> yeah, maybe when I run out of things to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, were these jobs dangerous? I mean, oh, yeah. sharp uh, tools. I mean, falling in uh, falling in the water. I mean, ha I'm sure oh, this was pretty rough. Oh yeah, uh, my uncle uh, Roy Frank talked about guys who he worked in the ice house, and uh, guys used to get poked in the in the hand with those ice. Ice picks, uh, the the uh, the, uh, the in the bars, uh, and of course that mechanism there going up and down. Uh, a lot of uh, OSHA wasn't around back then, so there was a lot of uh, moving parts all over the place in that conveyor. Uh, and of course, then the ice. Uh, a lot of accidents where folks, with horses and and men would fall into the ice. Uh, the horses they put a rope around their neck and pull them out with another horse. Uh, mm. And the workers they send to the boiler plant to uh, warm up and then get back to work. Oh. It was tough business uh, for 30 cents an hour. Yeah, it sure was. Another comment, this is very interesting. I had no idea how big some of the ice houses were. I had always thought that the Mets ice house in Milford and the Water Gap National Rec area was big. I was wrong. So I guess there's some up that way too. Yeah, yeah, there were small, small operations. Uh, the Mets Ice House, yeah, that was a small one. There was one there at Arlington Lake. Uh, but these, these larger ones, uh, like 500 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 50 feet high for the commercial operations, uh, they were all serviced by the railroads uh, for shipment. Uh, so they were usually pretty close to the railroad line. Warnertown is about two miles from the main line. Uh, but uh, they, were, they were massive structures, uh, a lot of ice. So the ice companies, they were their own company, but they must have had a, a, a relationship with the railroad company. Correct. Yeah, they had uh, they had agreements, and I, I remember reading somewhere about uh, a disagreement on how much it would cost to ship the ice, and back and forth between the uh, Ice Harvesters Association and the and the DL and W Railroad. Uh, yeah, they were they were connected to, and actually the railroad in some cases had their own ice houses. Uh, Hockey Pond and Kuba Township, and I also had one in Gooseboro, uh, where they had their own ice houses and and, and had ice for, for this their use in the, in the railroad shipping operation. So when they got it to the market, you said it would go to individual merchants. What is it? Yeah. Was there a warehouse in in the cities that would then store it and ditch and and sell it? How did that work? Uh, I, I believe they they loaded it. They must have had small. Yeah, they must have had small ice houses. Uh, Keep it cold because they'd unload the boxcar, which holds about 20 tons of ice. They needed something to uh, uh, to store it in for the ice band to cut it in smaller cakes and deliver it. Uh, don't know too much about that end of the operation. Right. Oh, here we have a uh, Kara Klaus has a comment. Huge thanks to all of you. This is great. Uh, you know, Kara is from Trout Lake. If anyone listening or watching has any photos from Trout Lake, they would love to see them. I know Kara's reached out to us to try to find some photos. So uh, if anybody has any, please uh, please get in touch with Trout Lake. They're they're interested in their history for sure. Thank you, Kara. Yeah, the foundation is still evident over there at, at, uh, at Trout Lake, and I want to get over there and measure that up. Uh, Kim Williams, Mr. Kim Williams has, in his presentation on ice houses and railroads, he's got actually dimensions of the ice houses and sketches of each ice house. Uh, and we've been verifying out in the field and some of the foundations and how big they are. Well, I'm sure we could make that happen. I'm sure you can yep. take a yep. look. Um, who owned the lakes that the ice house was harvested from? It varied. Uh, there was there were several ice companies, uh, uh, Pocono Mountain Ice Company, uh, Brady Brothers had the one in Brady's Lake. Uh, I can't think of any other ones right now, but uh, there were there was several several ice companies, uh, Lynchwood Ice Lake Ice Company. Uh, in some cases, then the smaller, larger companies would buy out the smaller ones and they'd combine back and forth. Uh, so, so it varied. There were different ice companies uh, out of Scranton or, or, or several uh, conglomerates, so to speak. 
and I, I had always assumed that it was local workers that were there, but then you had the boarding houses. So were they, did they travel in and stay for the winter? Or did they? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, in some cases, like for instance, Brady's Lake was, uh, was four miles from the nearest uh, town. <laughs> so uh, it was either take that four mile walk each day, which a lot of folks did, or else stay in the boarding house. Uh, but as you saw, they had uh, trains come in from Hoboken with, with workers because there was a shortage of labor. Uh, so they, they stayed in the, in the boarding house all the time. Other folks, like my great grandfather, lived in Toby Hannon and walked over to Bluesboro every day. And, uh, and actually, he was, uh, he was killed in the ice industry. He was uh, crossing the railroad tracks, uh, going into Bluesboro and hit by a train. Um, what did the men who worked for the ice companies do during the rest of the year when they weren't harvesting ice? It was uh, pretty much a lot of farmers because uh, winter time is kind of a slow time around the farm. So uh, a lot of farmers had volunteered to, to, to cut ice. Uh, and then, uh, you know, whatever their, their regular job was in the summertime, but uh, this, was, this was good wintertime employment. Right. And I really never thought that it was a 24 hour job, you know, icing up overnight. I never really thought about that, but it makes sense. Yep. Yep. Um, Ray Roper wrote, I worked icing railroad cars when I was in high school in the early 60s in Grand Junction, Colorado. Wow. Hmm. Uh, John Abel has a question. As they, as the ice house filled up, how did they adjust the height of the ramp? Yeah, it was a uh, block and tackle. Uh, big pulleys, and actually, uh, in our box car, we've got some of the block and tackle they use for raising the uh, raising that conveyor. But they'd uh, start off at a lower level, and then they'd raise that up as the ice house kept getting full. We started getting full up. So we go up to fifty feet. You said, you know, the, yeah, yep, that's yep. pretty. That's that's big. Yep, that's harder and harder the higher you get. Right. <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> Um, let's see, any other questions we have here that I didn't get to? Just kind of going back through. Uh, somebody says, fortunately, there's a Facebook page with a drone video of modern ice harvesting. Yeah, uh, we posted that on the Kuba Township Historical Association website, I think, or Facebook page. But right. uh, yeah, a guy came out with the drone and did, uh, did some pictures uh, a few years ago. So have you been doing it since you were a child? I've been doing it for 29 years. 29. <laughs> have you noticed, you said the one year, like this past year, which was bitter cold, but the other year it was almost 60 degrees. Yeah, uh, actually, well, before we started using the power saw, we used to use the plows. We, worked, we actually did a two-day harvest. And one year we, uh, we had about, oh, about seven or eight inches of ice and we, we cut ice on Saturday with plows. And then we, Sunday morning, we got up and uh, it was warm and we couldn't even get on the ice. It had melted well, over. <laughs> so we, had, we did not have a second day harvest that oh, year. Oh, it's crazy. Well, we will certainly uh, be sharing the, the information for 2023's ice harvest with all of our members and friends and supporters. So hopefully you can get another, another huge crowd out for this coming yeah. winter. I'm just looking up the date here for uh, for uh, January uh, in January 28th. Okay. 2023, and the local VFW will be serving breakfast starting at 7 a.m. All right. Well, I've I've done it once before. I probably will have to go back though. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. I really appreciate right. you spending welcome. spending the evening with us and sharing your knowledge. This was. This was really, really wonderful. I learned a lot, including about Shine Boy too, which I'm not gonna forget for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. All have right. A nice, have a nice night. Yep, you too. Thank you.